Next we have uh, Patrick Zan, telling us how supernova structure and radio synthesis from corpulence to ground. <coughs> for giving me the opportunity to speak at this fabulous venue. And I would like to start out by thanking my less fortunate collaborators, Corolla uh, Hellinger and Chris Breyer at Los Alamos National Lab, and Greg Mangs, playing the grad student at ASU. And we've been working on the connection between the structures and nucleosynthesis sites in the explosion itself and what we see in the remnant. Uh, both for the sake of understanding the explosion and for the astrobiologist side of my life, um, understanding how material gets out into the wider universe and enriches nearby forming stars and solar systems. So we undertook to be the first to perform self-consistent simulations following the supernova from the launch of the explosion all the way out to, at this point, decades and the OE, uh, very soon centuries, so we can do direct comparisons with well-observed nearby supernova <coughs> remnants like Cas A and G292. Our primary tool for explosions is the SNSPH uh, smooth, type, smooth <coughs> particle hydrodynamics code. And for these particular simulations that I'll show today, we have a range of imposed asymmetries and post-processing with a moderately sized network that is complete through all of the readily observable elements in a remnant. The progenitors for today are a 16 solar mass strip binary that explodes as it's transitioning to a WNL star to match the Cas A progenitor and 15 to 20 solar mass red supergenitor progenitors. And our tool for doing the progenitors is Tycho, which has a non-local turbulent convection and hydrodynamic mixing algorithm, which is essential to doing massive stars, and a large nuclear network for setting up more for the process. <coughs> Uh, the simulation here is typical of one of our early stage explosions. You see the shock moving out through the star and then developing strong Rayleigh Taylor instabilities that propagate out and grow to large distances and late times. In fact, we see a uh, Rickmeyer Meshkoff or Rayleigh Taylor instability forming at each of the density and entropy boundaries in our progenitor model these tend to be very low amplitude. What dominates the structure is actually the reverse shock when shock hits the boundary between the hydrogen envelope and the helium. And when that reverse shock hits the boundary between helium and carbon and oxygen, we develop very strong Rayleigh Taylor instabilities. And one of the practical effects of that is if you don't have a massive hydrogen envelope out here to generate for our shock, you get very weak Rayleigh Taylor figures. And in Cas A, we do not see the very strong extended flocculent filaments that we see in some other core collapse remnants from red supergiant projectors. Our main tool for comparing to observed supernovae are nucleosynthetic maps. And I would love to go into nucleosynthesis in tremendous detail, but to go into focus on just one example. Uh, in one set of simulations, we have a central compact object that is not fixed in space as it accretes momentum, or as it accretes material, it accretes momentum and is able to move from the center. And we find that this generates large-scale fluid motions that resemble convection. And these motions generate variable density histories that give strong alpha-rich freeze-out, which you can see comparing helium to nickel-56 
And this actually overturns this regular Taylor ring from that early reverse shot. And <clears throat> situations like this can be set up in this fashion by convection in the central engine neutrino gain region, like we saw in the last talk, and by convective asymmetries in the progenitor. As an example of the kind of thing we can do with these nucleosynthetic maps, we provided titanium-44 from a bipolar and a symmetric explosion to a new star before launch, and they produce synthetic maps to compare with the titanium-44 distribution in Cas A. And rather unsurprisingly, we find that a single component explosion does not account for the structure we see. But these brand new results from titanium-44 and some of these explosions with strong convection, I'm really curious to see what they produce. And of course, we have to move out into a certain cell medium, which as we heard yesterday and we'll hear more today, is extremely complex. Uh, so we have done simulations so far with high-density molecular material, which is what you see here, low-density cool ISM, and red supergiant wind embedded in an ISM. And here we see the oxygen-rich supernova material in white, and we can see those really Taylor fingers propagating out into the molecular material past the evacuated cavity from the supernova, and they persist uh, in this situation out to about a third of a parsec before we run out of simulation space. Looking at things in more detail, <laughs> in these images, blue is, once again, oxygen, green is the hydrogen envelope, and then we have density, so you can see the shocks in the red colors. And for the Cas A progenitor, uh, when it's swept up about six times the ejected mass of material, there's still not terribly strong RT fingers, and but there are generated primarily by the reverse shock. In the 20 solar mass, though, we see those fingers extending most of the way through the envelope, even when you've swept up uh, only the ejected mass. When you've swept up about eight times, the stalks of the ring of the Taylor fingers have shredded, but the bullets are still quite happily going long and have penetrated past the reverse shock and the envelope is shredded. Things become even more interesting when you have a supergiant wind. So again, we have the oxygen-rich material in blue and the stellar wind material here in pink colors and velocity vectors in the green. And you see four different kinds of structures in this simulation. We have Rayleigh Taylor instabilities from the explosion down here. We also have instabilities from the interaction of the forward shock with the boundary between the star and its wind, and between the wind and the surface of the wind. And that effectively shreds the wing into a very clumpy medium. And finally, we have instabilities when the reverse shock from the ejecta sweeping up circumstellar material propagates inward. And what took us rather by surprise was that when these instabilities propagate inward and interact with the Rayleigh Taylor fingers from the explosion, they actually consolidate. So we might expect that the interaction with the CSM to erase a lot of the structure that we generate in the explosion. But in fact, in this kind of situation, it enhances it and promotes its survivability. So what we see in supernova remnants is actually directly connectable to the processes that we find in the explosion and is quite a good diagnostic. Yeah. 
And so moving forward, we have a much larger grid of progenitor models um, moving from about 12 to 30 solar masses in flying steps and up to 100 solar masses with dynamic mass loss at uh, multiple metallicities. And right now we have non-rotating models and we're starting production on rotating models. Uh, we are also going to put in 3D asymmetries based on convection in the progenitor star, which can be quite significant radial perturbations in excess of 10%. And we'll be doing that uh, by stochastically <coughs> constructing the 3D anisotropies. It's one of the nice things about having a uh, physical theory of convection for stars um, when you can track the hydrodynamic motions, you can reconstruct the fluctuations based on the stellar structure. And so we get approximately 3D initial conditions for perhaps without having to actually spend time doing 3D interior simulations. And we have done 3D interior simulations, so we're confident that we're capturing the behavior fairly well. Uh, we also have mass loss histories for our stars. Here's just an example for three strict binary companions. Uh, this is mass loss versus time, which is very episodic once you lose most of the hydrogen on board. And this is velocities down here. So we'll be creating more complex certain stellar environments to explode these stars up to. And then finally, for a set of these explosions that look the most like our observed remnants, we will go back and do 3D collapse like we've done in this uh, simulation, in particular to look at the asymmetries that are generated by the central engine. And just a brief plug for the supernova analysis application. Uh, this is going to be out later this year, and this is a web-based community tool uh, to look at theoretical and observational light curves, correlation tables between them, and statistical analysis software to compare them. The initial release is going to have uh, swift light curves loaded and joint ASU LAML uh, light curves for the theory ones, but there will be a facility for user uploads uh, slightly later. So you will be able to take your favorite theoretical light curve or your favorite observational light curve and find out what it best matches in the database. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Any questions? So you're producing light curves from your models? Um, with these, we haven't produced light curves yet, but uh, we're doing a separate project to do those. Eventually, we'll get these um, switched over to the range code, which is a uh, uh, adaptive mesh code. So we have to do a translation between the SP. Any more questions? Let's thank Brian.